I'll move around a lot. I'm not going to follow you. <coughs> yeah. All right. How you doing? Uh, my name is Jim Clark. And uh, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Ian Bush for inviting me to come out and you know give a talk. And what I'm going to talk about is log correlation with uh, your IDS spec. You know? um, um, this is a quote from a guy named H.D. Moore. I don't know how many people are familiar with his work. Um, he's a leading researcher. He works for Rapid7, and he writes a thing called Metasploit, and the guy's an animal. And he's, com he's a complete animal, and so he emailed this to me. And as I was telling Ian, uh, when you get an email from H.D. Moore, either it's that is a crappy idea, or it's something like this. So I knew I was kind of like maybe on the right line. So who am I? Um, I've written a couple of books for Singress Publishing. Uh, I do a lot of work in the voice over IP world, uh, you know, security in the voice over IP world. Um, I'm also the CTO of Softlink, uh, which we do 24 by 7 monitoring of your IDS and IPS systems. So it doesn't matter if it's 3 a.m. in the morning on Christmas Eve, there's actually a live body on staff monitoring, looking over, making sure you aren't getting a false positive that you know, might be triggered, and you know, calling you up and telling you whenever things are going bad. Um, uh, I regularly speak at things like DEF CON and Hackers on Planet Earth. Last year I was in uh, Germany uh, speaking there uh, at the Chaos Computer Club. And I've written a couple of tools like um, IWAR, which is more about auditing your, uh, your phone network. Uh, like your old-fashioned traditional phone network to find all the legacy things. And of course, say again, and I've been at a few magazines like Wired and stuff like that. Okay, so why did we write Sagan? Well, in mid-2009, uh, we had a call from this company. They, they did a lot of uh, credit card transactions. And they suspected that they might have a break-in. Now, at their organization, they did have IDS in place, and they were doing, very, they were doing centralized logging. And Basically, they, they weren't quite sure, but they wanted to hire us to come in and take a look at what was going on. And this is what we found the attacker doing. Now, what I'm going to show here is actually a Linux server, a Unix kind of based system um, of what the hacker or the attacker was doing. So, you'll see up at the top here, he sets his history file to dev null. And one of the things he's trying to do is make sure it doesn't record what he's typing. Okay. And what he's doing now is he's uploading a, a small C program with a Perl wrapper to basically go through and delete all the log entries uh, uh, that might be used to identify that attack has taken place. So basically when the administrator gets back on here, they're going to look and see, oh, well, nobody's logged in. And you know, he's basically trying to cover his tracks. And he's just about done here. And he's gone. Now, there's nothing really new about this tech. This has actually been going on for decades. There's, there's nothing new at all. However, the attacker evades stuff like uh, their host IDS system, which basically, they were running things like Tripwire, or if you think of like ViperDB, or basically, what those software does is it goes out to uh, critical directories, critical, critical system directories, and makes sure that critical binaries haven't been modified. Because sometimes when an attacker gets into a system, he might modify a binary, like backdoor it, so to speak. And then the idea is that the software will run and detect the, uh, the uh, piece of software has been changed. But he was evading all of this. And what he was doing is he just looked through and he saw, oh, they're checking these critical directories. Well, I just won't put, I won't try to modify their system level stuff. I'll just upload my Trojanized version, in this case, of Secure Shell, which is usually used for remote administrations of uh, uh, Linux and Unix servers. And he would uh, compile it in a kind of a temp directory that wasn't being monitored. And then he would replace the, uh, the, the SSH daemon that was in memory, the Secure Shell daemon, with his Trojanized ver version. And of course, it didn't leave any logs anywhere. Because what he would do is just connect in, and then he could give a special command to the SSH daemon, which would give all the passwords of the administrators that have logged in and whatnot. And then he removes the source code. So there's no trace. There's no trace of him and the fact that there's nothing in the logs, and there's nothing on the file system to find him about. Now, the client was using Splunk. And keep in mind, whenever they talk about Splunk, I am not knocking Splunk. I actually like Splunk a lot. It just so happened that this client was doing this in a really kind of silly way. So basically what they were doing is, is uh, the client at the um, credit card transaction company, they were taking the logs every five minutes and getting snapshots of them. So basically, if you think of it this way, if you have a thousand lines of logs and the agent starts up, it goes, okay, I have a thousand new lines of logs, ship that off to a centralized logging server. 
Okay? And then five minutes later, he goes by, and there's a hundred new logs that come in. Then he, he knows the offset, the last place that he stopped in the logs. So there's only a hundred new lines, so he ships off just that hundred lines. Well, what the attacker knew was that between, there's a five minute span, five minute window. So if he could get in, modify the logs, let's say he modified five lines of those new 100 lines, that only the 95 will get shipped back to the server minus the evidence that he'd been into the machine. And of course, as you saw, the attacker did this in about 12 seconds. And he was doing this on every single system that he touched. Now, things like Splunk, as I said, are great, but it's the console that you use uh, can, can help you a little bit, but really comes down to the operator, about what he's you know, uh, capable of looking for and finding problems with the system. In this case, the operator, he did notice that he had this strange anomaly going on, which led to them th thinking that there might be some sort of uh, network intrusion. And basically what it was, when a person logs in, it creates a log, when it goes in through secure shell. So it creates, this person logged in, he's on the system, gives time date. Well, he was deleting those logs, but as soon as he would get off the system, he would type exit to get off, and it, that leaves the connection closed. So what the administrator noticed, I have all these connections closed for somebody SSHing in, secure shelling in, but I never have any opens. And that doesn't make any sense. Something isn't driving. And that's why they called us. Now, they did have some IDS in place. Now, the problem is, is that the attacker, I mean, he knew the password, he knew how to get into the system. So he wasn't trying to brute force an attack and try to break his way in. He already knew a username and password, how to get into the system. And plus, from the IDS standpoint, from the packet standpoint, uh, secure shell's encrypted. So the IDS really couldn't do deep packet inspection to figure out what's going on, you know, what the user's, you know, necessarily typing. Now, one thing it's thought of, well, if he's doing it this at 3 a.m. in the morning, obviously, then you should flag that. But he wasn't doing it at 3 a.m. in the morning. He was doing it at 9.30 in the morning. So he was coming in behind other administrators. The IDS system, there's nothing that looks suspicious about this. So this is where we came up with the idea of Sagan. Now, as I said already before, Sagan is not Splunk. Splunk takes your logs, and you send it off to a centralized server, and it uh, uh, basically archives everything. And they give you a very nice console that you can go through and search and look for different types of events and whatnot, okay? The, we, we don't do that. That's not, that space is already covered for us. So what we do is, what we want to do is find, as the stuff comes in, in 100% real time, if uh, a bad event occurs, and then notify you. Now, there's other software that'll actually do this kind of stuff. But some of it's semi-real-time. Remember I was talking about the offsets? They use that, or they, it, it, it just feels kludgy. If you've ever installed a piece of software and go, this doesn't feel right, it doesn't seem, you'll get kind of what I mean. So we wrote Sagan from the ground up, 100% real-time. Um, and we also want to make Sagan really easy to install uh, from a, uh, a standpoint of an administrator and maintain. So, Nowadays, really, if you're just monitoring your perimeter IDS, IPS systems, and even if you, you know, if you're not looking at your log level, then um, you're, you might be missing data. Um, and another bad thing is you have your IDS console, and then you have your Splunk console, and then you might have, say, another console that monitors network health. Well, if something does that you think might go bad, you have to manually go through and kind of track through and see what's going to what. And there's a lot of room for error for that. So it's not really, you know, you're not getting cor good correlation at that point. Now, there are actually products that actually do kind of what we're doing, but they're usually proprietary and very expensive. What we're doing is a completely open source uh, uh, idea behind it with the correlation and whatnot. And it's basically uh, based off of uh, uh, a Linux operating system or FreeBSD or OpenBSD, whatever Unix type that you want to use. We don't currently do Windows because in our shop, we don't have a lot of Windows servers out in this field that need this kind of stuff. And I'll get that in a minute. Now, so how does this fit in with uh, our infrastructure at Softlink? Well, we already have this infrastructure where we can monitor on a 24-hour, you know, by seven-day basis, um, uh, store backing. So basically, whenever we go to a company, say it's a small, uh, small bank or whatnot, we can plop in this box and we can monitor their store. Uh, uh, instance 24 hours a day. So we already have this infrastructure to monitor 24 hours a day. Now, this gives us the ability, of course, to monitor anything in the network, just about. So for instance, your Cisco routers, 
your, uh, your firewalls, your 48 firewalls, if you use those, other Unix systems, Windows events. For instance, like there's a great piece of software you can load up for Windows, and it basically takes your event log and converts it to syslog and sends it onto the server. Uh, wireless access points, uh, things like tripwire or whatnot. We can monitor all that on a 24-hour by seven basis. And why wouldn't you do this? I mean, the idea of doing the offset kind of thing is kind of silly, because almost everything that you buy or touch and put in your network has the ability to do 100% real-time logging. Uh, as I said, like your ASAs and your PIT. Even if you have, like, say, a Unix server, and your Unix server runs Apache, it has the ability to send logs out in real time, because people don't usually set it up that way. Squid, if you run a proxy server, so that you can send logs about what site users are going to. You can send that out in real time. Your voice over IP system, if you look at, like, Asterisk and stuff like that. Your mail servers, of course, SSH, POP, IMAP. Even the cheapest devices that you get. I went to um, the store the other day to get a new wireless access point. I bought a D-Link 615. The thing is $20. So it was $20 at the time. They had some sort of sale going on. The first thing I noticed whenever I powered it up is remote logging. Well, why not? I mean, it's already there. I can monitor it. But a lot of people just forget that the stuff is in their network and ignore that. Or they trust the local log events that happen on it, which is bad. Um, and even like PAP2 adapters, they're like these little voice over IP boxes that you can plug a real phone in and you know, your Ethernet jack. Uh, even those support it. And of course, Windows servers. Just about everything, to some degree or another, you can get it to go through in real time. So why aren't we doing this in real time? It kind of seems silly to me that, we, that some places still find that doing offsets and basically in the Unix world, tail dash effing logs, and um, ship it when you know uh, the offset changes is just silly. Because our attacker in uh, the first case, he actually took advantage of that. He knew, like, okay, I got this time window to log in. If I log in, 12 seconds, it's gone, ship it off to the centralized server. The logs are no good at that point. So what we decided to do was kind of do everything a little bit different. And so there's other software out there that does similar things. We decided to write it in C. And the reason is, is because we wanted to have a very, very small footprint. Um, uh, for instance, if you load up Sagan and you have it monitoring your network, the rule set alone, let's say you have a thousand rules loaded, you're usually eating five, six megabram. This is software that you can actually run on your laptop to create a pop-up to tell you like something bad is going on your laptop, be it hard drive dying, be it you know a security event. We also wrote it as a multi-threaded application. And the reason why we did that is because when you have Sagan, and he's out there, and he's monitoring, he's watching logs, and it could be 10 logs a second, but it might be 2,000 log lines a second. Well, the time that it takes Sagan, if we didn't write it in a threaded way, to go over and insert data into your SQL database or whatever, we might miss stuff that's in the buffer. Basically, as logs come in, he goes over to log stuff into the database, and the data's passing him by. And then by the time he gets back, the data's already gone. So we needed to write it in a multi-threaded way. So basically Sagan will say, I got this log entry, and oh, it's a bad thing. He'll spawn up a new thread and say, go do my bidding, go log it to the database. I have to concentrate on keep watching what events come in. And the other thing that we decided to do as well was use a snort like rule set. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you guys are experienced with snort or played with snort or whatnot. Um, Okay, well, Snort has a very um, uh, standardized way of doing rule sets. And it's kind of interesting to see even third-party software that you get uh, for IDS. You can usually import Snort rules. It's become that kind of standardized. Well, I mean, it's not a standard, but I mean, it's become kind of a, a known standardized way of writing rules. And this gives us a little bit of an advantage. Because if we write our rule sets for Sagan, similar to Snort, then we get access to all the back-end management utilities that Snort uses. So, for instance, if you have an IDS system, and he goes out every night to update his rule set so he can get the latest you know, um, uh, attacks that you might see on your network, you might use a piece of software like uh, Oink Master or Poolport or, or whatever. The, the back-end management software that Snort uses, we can take advantage of. So that's one less aspect from our standpoint that we don't have to worry about that. The management software is already done. So if we use a snort-like rule set, 
then we take advantage of that. We can just pluck it from the SNORT community. Um, and we can also attempt to correlate log events to our IDS packet. Now, remember how I said earlier how you, you, know, you have your, your console, your IDS console, and you have your, your uh, log console, and you have your other, you know, you have these multiple consoles that you have to go through. Well, since Sagan can write to a SNORT database, he can take the events and put it into the same database. Gives you one console. And we can kind of do that in kind of nifty ways. So now we can actually start correlating events from an IDS level and a log level. And I'll get to that just here in just a second. So if we use, uh, this is Kevin Johnson, who's out of Jacksonville, actually. Uh, he wrote this great utility called uh, BASE. Actually, it was a spinoff of a thing called ACID. And it's a basically an IDS front end. So the IDS console, um, he, uh, if you look down at the bottom, we have our sensors here, which are basically our, um, our snort sensors. And these are real our snort sensors, but the top one is actually our Sagan sensor. So Sagan operates as a separate sensor ID to, uh, to the system. And the reason is, is if you just want to look at log events, or you just want to look at IDS events, you can do either or, or you can mix the two together. So whenever you look at your log events, they look very similar to what you would see if you're using store. So you know you have um, your classifications and your signature, like uh, which basically tells you what signature is triggered. It looks very similar. But let's say you're not maybe a uh, uh, base kind of guy. You're going with a kind of newer snorby kind of setup, which is the same thing. It's just a console that goes back and hits the SQL database uh, for your IDS events. Well, that's fine. Because, again, here are our real, you know, um, store IDS events, and here's our log events up here. Basically, my point is, it doesn't matter what the console is. We're taking advantage of the consoles that are already written for the IDS system, like Base and Snorby. Let's assume for a second maybe you had a proprietary console, like you're using something that was maybe in-house. It doesn't matter, because we're using the same SQL backend and SQL database types that Snort uses. So let's assume for a second that you're not uh, any kind of snort person, you're not interested in correlation and stuff like that. Well, you can still use Sagan. I mean, it has the typical bells and whistles that you would see in this kind of you know um, security event information management kind of structure. Um, you can of course send out emails if you see a bad log event. You know, you can say you know send it out to the administrator, and you can actually perform, uh, set by priority. Only send me. Priorities one and two, but three, I'm not as sure about. I don't want my e mailbox to get flooded or whatever. You can set it up in such a way that you can say, I only want these certain events. Sagan can also write to other types of archival databases like Logzilla, which kind of work like a Splunk like system where it basically takes all the data. And that just kind of cleans things up a little bit, but that's a whole other matter. Um, you can also write your own uh, plugins for it. And usually that would be done in C, because as I said, we've written the entire thing in C. However, not everybody's a C programmer, but you might be a PHP guy, or a Perl guy, or pick your language. It doesn't really matter, because what we do is we have external thread support. So you can basically tell Sagan, when you see a bad event, email it off, put it into my IDS backend, but also call my custom routine, so in Perl, or whatever language you want, and Sagan will pass that information over to your custom routine. And then you can do, if you, like, so for instance, if you said, I want to write this Perl program that basically uh, hits my voice over IP system and will call me up in the middle of the night and say, there is a open SSH attack. You could write that. We're not going to do it, but you could. So you can write your own plugins for it and in the language that you want. So for Anybody who's not familiar with SNORT and how the rule sets are, this is a basic rule set. It's very, very similar to SNORT, obviously. So what we have here is just a really basic rule set, and it's looking for uh, SMTP traffic, mail traffic. So it's a TCP port 25, okay? So we have this, what we're going to cover here is the PCRE option, the content, the no case, the program, and we'll go into the reference and stuff like that. So, Sagan can use what the PCRE flag is called a regular expression. 
And with regular expressions, you can kind of do some kind of nifty stuff with. We're searching for content, be it in packets, in this case, in logs. And you can do some neat stuff. So our PCRE says, basically, if the, the end attacker or possible attacker types in verify pipe, being an or, expand, expn, slash, and the I means I don't want a case sensitive, uppercase, lowercase, mixed, don't care, then that's one flag that we have. The content works a little bit different because, as I said, we're trying to build this thing from the ground up to be as efficient as possible both on memory and CPU. Sometimes using PCRE adds extra overhead because you can do really nifty stuff with it, but it adds extra overhead on it. Sometimes you just want to find out if a string exists in a log. That's where content comes in. So he basically can see that's the, the function that calls, and basically what it does, it says, is this string in here? And then right under it, we have no case, which tells content if it's the word root, I don't care if it's uppercase, lowercase, there's one capital O in it, I don't care. If it meets this criteria, which is actually space root, then and these two mix, then we know we flag something. The program, we only want it, this is going to be from a mail service from an email service. So we look for SMMTA. In this case, this is SYNMAIL, which is commonly used in you know, Linux boxes and Unix boxes. So we don't want to look for this data, you know, look for these expressions from, from, from programs that we don't care about. There wouldn't be any sense. So we say, only if it comes from SYNMAIL and it matches these criteria, then let's get a little bit alarmed about it. And then, and this correlation stuff will all kind of come together here in a minute. We classify it as an attempted recon. Is somebody looking at your system and seeing if they can probe it for information? A verify or expand route isn't normal email traffic. It's somebody actually going there and looking and saying, hey, can I get a little bit of extra information off their mail server that shouldn't be maybe handing out? So we classify it as an attempted recon, which is the same as snort. We also make a reference. So if the reference basically says, if the user gets this alert but doesn't quite understand exactly what the alert is, we give them a URL to go to. So they can go to it and read more about like, the type of attack that is took place. That could be through a CVE database or a Microsoft link or whatever. And then finally, we have this thing called parse IP simple. And that gives us the real source of the attacker. Because when you're dealing with logs, you, you kind of end up in this weird situation. Because basically what happens is, in normal syslog traffic, uh, the source and destination end up getting a little bit kind of mangled up a little bit. So, like, so for instance, let's say 192.168.0.1 is attacking uh, 10.0.0.1, and he's hitting the SMTP port, port 25, the mail port, and our syslog server is at 10.0.0.50. So, Dot one is going to be talking to dot fifty. The information that you actually get is going to show, yeah, there was an attack, and it's coming from the source is ten dot zero dot zero dot one, and the message is going to ten dot zero dot zero dot fifty. It doesn't mention the one ninety two traffic because that's embedded in the message. That does us no good, especially from a correlation standpoint. So basically, what you're asking administrators to do is go into a console and look at each message and try to figure out where's the actual attack coming from. That doesn't make sense. That's where parse, uh, parse IP simple comes in. It basically takes the IP address out of the, um, the message so that we can determine what the real source of the attack is. So there's a couple of things that we already know. At the very beginning of that rule set, we had this alert TCP. Da, 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 da. Now, in the SNORT world or IDS world, it would usually be a little bit different. We actually do the exact opposite of snort. So if this were a snort rule that started out like this, we would say alert on TCP traffic, watch TCP traffic for anything from an external network going to my home network on port 25. Well, we flip this a little bit. This lets Sagan know if you see this alert and it's coming from SendMail, uh, the email program, it's going to probably be TCP. I mean, that's just the way it is. And it's probably going to be on port 25. Because that's where usually if you're doing an email service, unless you're doing something funky about moving a port, of course, then you can just modify the rule, it lets Sagan know ahead of time the TCP port and, and stuff like that. So the way Sagan sees it is the attack is actually coming from the real source, not 10.0.0.1, 10.0.50. He says, wait a minute, 
I'm going to look inside this message, and inside the message it actually says that 192.168.0.1 is the source of my attack. And the, he's, he's actually attacking 10.0.0.1. He actually records it that way. So, if we look at correlation a little bit, how we've done it so far. Well, we already have some, a little bit of correlation right off the get-go. Timestamps. That's assuming that you're all using something like network time protocol to keep all your servers in sync. Right? So you have a little bit of uh, uh, correlation right there. Well, he matched the PCRE and content, and we classify it the same as SNORT. Now, the rule that I've shown before, your IDS system's going to pick up, and your SIGIN's going to pick up. So we're trying to make the information that the IDS on the packet level matches closely to what is coming from your logs. So the classification, we classify it exactly the same as SNORT. Well, it's going to be TCP on port 25. So we have a little bit more correlation. We know the true source is 192.168. There's a little bit more correlation. The true destination is 10.001. That's pretty good. So now we know, so from the IDS standpoint and the log standpoint, we have almost the exact same information. We're missing one little factor, and that would be the source port of the attack. But we got pretty good correlation. So if you want to generate a report with your logs, and if all this stuff correlates correctly, like for instance, which would in that uh, verify, expand, root, mail, you know, attempted recon type of thing, it would actually line up fairly well. So you could say, show me a log, show me the IDS, show them together. Oh, now I have two events. I can, you know, I have, the more data I have, the better it is. And the way that we get the uh, source port in some cases is if you look at, like, say, for instance, an open SSH, so that's a secure shell thing. So Bob User is trying to log in, and he's trying to log in from 192.168.0.1. Notice the port. Now I have the source port. In some cases, we can't always do this, but I can correlate it down even more. So my IDS information is almost on target with my log information, and I'm putting them together in the same exact console. So if we go through a really simple rule, we're looking for an invalid user, remember, invalid user or uh, illegal user, and we're looking for the program SSHD, and we kind of went through that. And then we also have our parse IP, which grabs the real IP address. And then parse port simple, which allows us to grab, remember that port that I was saying in the previous slide? If we look back here, that grabs this. So now, we don't only have a timestamp, we have that is TCP that's going to port 25, has a source port from the attacker side going to this machine. We can almost correlate it very, very well. And the other thing that we've added in here is threshold because I don't know how many of you have ever seen like running an SSH server uh, on port 22 and just throw it out on the internet. You're going to see a ton, shit ton of crap. Pardon my French. Um, you're going to see a, a, a bunch of people trying to do really lame stuff to the SSH port because they're going to be trying to brute force, guess, username, password, and then you're going to get alarmed every time this happens. Well, that's unacceptable. So we throw in just like the Stork does the exact same idea of threshold. So if the guy sends 100 attacks, tell me about the first five, but don't tell me about the other 95, because now you're just filling up my email box, so you're screwing around with my, uh, my console, so I can threshold. That doesn't mean that the rule is disabled. It just means that it's temporarily uh, squelching uh, uh, from the particular source IP address. So we can squelch events like that. Now, not everything is correlatable but you probably still want it. A classic example is, for instance, let's say your Cisco router has a power supply fan failure, and it sends out a message. You can't really correlate it, because you can't blame some guy in Russia for breaking the fan inside your Cisco router. I mean, so it's not really correlatable. Or, for instance, if you have uh, a user in your network and he opens a PDF attachment, and the PDF attachment crashes the program, while that might be interesting, and you might want to record it and maybe even look into it, because PDF and uh, Adobe hasn't been doing so hot lately, you might want to record that, but it's considered a local event. So we treat it as a local event. So the workstation that generated the alert is the source, and the destination is my centralized logging server. We don't want to ignore those events. So if we look back on our first part, how the attack. Remember, IDS didn't really work out that well, because he was following basically the guidelines that IDS, that his, their IDS was looking for, okay? So how could we, 
how could Sagan have prevented this type of activity from happening in the network? Or at least give the administrator a clue, hey, something's going on here. Okay? So remember at the very beginning, I noted that he was taking his history file and he was putting it to dev null. Basically what he was doing is he was saying, set my history, which records what he types, set that to, uh, to the bit bucket in the sky. Get rid of it. Because if an administrator comes back and sees what commands I'm typing, I'm going to be in trouble. Well, it doesn't matter at this point. He can set that all day long. The bash rule allows us to take uh, the um, bash, which is actually a command shell, basically gives uh, users the ability to enter commands on a Unix system, for instance. It gives it the ability to send it off to a, a, a centralized logging server in real time. So he can set that stupid thing all day long to you know, <coughs> dev null. We don't care. Go ahead. But the one thing, when he sets that, that's going to give us a clue that he's probably up to something that he's probably... Like trying to hide something in the background. Let's say you have an administrator, and he says, uh, you go to him and you say, hey, that directory is missing, Bob. Did, did you delete that directory? He goes, oh, no, no, I, I didn't delete that. Then you can go back to your Splunk console and pull up the commands and go, well, Bob, it says right here you deleted it. Can you explain that? Or if the administrator is like setting his history to dev null, you might go, why is he, you know, it, you can classify a suspicious activity. <coughs> So there's some other stuff that we're working on with Sagan. Um, in a lot of environments, we can't, uh, like let's say you have a thousand machines out there and they're all already logging to a centralized log point. We can't always uh, just go in and say, put in our box and reconfigure everything. That's also, you, you can't do it. So what we have is that actually uh, that we've been working on is where we can take our Sagan box and put it into a network right next to, uh, say, our centralized logging system. And then we can create like a mirror port or spam port. So basically, he's seeing the exact same logs that the, uh, that the centralized logging system is. And he can read it off the wire as it goes by. And he can say, oh, that's bad. Send that out. Oh, that's good. You know, let that flow. And basically, you don't have to reconfigure anything in your network. And that was by um, an idea of Bruce Wayne, because we actually got into an environment like that. And Mathis is actually working on it. Um, we're looking at putting into Sagan uh, a thing called Snortsan, which basically would make it kind of an uh, intrusion prevention system. With Snort, you have uh, the Snort IDS system. You have two ways of doing it. You can do it inline, which means that your traffic has to flow through and be detected. And then on that machine, it can firewall it. With Snortsan, you can say if the Snort box detects is bad traffic, he can actually go and say, talk to that Cisco router or the perimeter and tell them to stop that traffic right now. So, and a lot of people don't like to put maybe necessarily one box in line, you know, because it adds up yet another point of failure. And also the advantage to Snort Sam is it gives you the ability to talk to Cisco routers and I believe FortiGate firewalls or Linux systems. It doesn't really matter. Um, we're also looking at, and I think this one's actually going to be an easy one to do. I could probably do it over a weekend, just haven't got around to it. It's been requested, the uh, IETF Intrusion Detection Exchange Format, which has kind of gotten a little bit more popular, and it basically re records alerts in an XML format that are interchangeable between, like, so, you know, store can write this format, this can write this, so that you have, like, uh, one centralized uh, format that you can read to find out about uh, events that have happened in your network. And as I said, I don't think this one's going to be a hard one. I wouldn't be surprised if it gets in there too, too soon. Um, we're also looking at this thing called Unified 2 Output. And basically what the idea here is, and they use it with Snort a lot, is that, for one thing, from the Snort standpoint, it takes uh, the... Snort doesn't have to worry about inserting bad events into a database. It can actually hand that off to a program called Barnyard, which looks at this file, looks at the Barnyard file, or excuse me, the Unified 2 file. And basically, so when a bad event happens, he just writes to a binary log file and then Barnyard on the other side grabs that log file and can ship it off to your to your IDS backend. The the good part about it though is imagine if you're working in the data center and you've got to take down your database for a little while. Well, it's unacceptable if your database is down and events are happening for them not to somehow get logged to your database. So basically, what it does is queue events. So you take down your database for an hour, you work on it, you get it back up. Then right when it comes back up, Barnyard sees it, and he starts shipping those events in the last hour that it's all. So you haven't lost any events. But we kind of get into a weird situation here. Because now we're storing again 
uh, uh, the events on the local system. So if an attacker, I mean, imagine the scenario. The attacker creates some sort of denial of service attack and gets your back-end database. Then he comes in, and now he can modify these logs and then stop doing a denial of service and let his new clean logs go through. So we've been talking about adding in um, uh, crypto and checksumming, which basically means that Sagan, when he goes to write out to this unified two output format, he does this checksum. He does like a MD5 or whatever he wants to do. He does a checksum of it and says, okay, that's the way I left you. Now the next time he comes around and he wants to log back to the database, before he writes to the file, he says, okay, are these checksums? Are they still adding up? Okay, cool. I'll keep adding to that file. Oh, they've changed. I need to let the administrator know because something just modified this file that should never have been modified. So that's just an idea that we've been throwing out there. And SQL uh, support is kind of like a real-time console. It's actually kind of an application that you load. And we've been requested to do that. It lets you watch the events in real time. Like It's not a web interface. It's actually an application. So you can see this stuff kind of coming in. And so it's easy to add this kind of real-time support into your software. Like, so for instance, if you have um, your applications and they're written in a PHP format, you have your, your web server and it, it, it's running an application that's with PHP or Perl or whatever language it is, it's simple to add in this kind of real-time support for uh, your programs. So for example, I mean, in C, it's roughly five lines of code. And my point is, is that if you add this into your code, then you can write your own rule sets. And you can say, these are my custom in-house rule sets. And if I see a guy come in and he's tried a password five times or he's trying to bypass authentication or something like that, to send out this alert and say you can pick it up. And we're not talking a lot of code here to add that in. This is where you would put your message. A bad thing has happened. Or this jackass has forgotten his password. Or whatever it might be. And the same thing with Perl. We're looking at two, three lines of code. This is easy stuff to add into your backend support. So, why are you saving? Actually, it's an open source product. It's uh, free as in speech. It's uh, under the GPL uh, 2 license. That means you can go down if you want to. You can go back to your shop with your little test environment, download it, install it, play with it. You can even download our rule sets that we commonly go through and update. We add a new support for different equipment. We're always adding, so that's all being actively developed. We do this, you know, all the time. Because in our environment, we're using the software. So as we see a new need come up, we'll add it to our rule set and we'll put it out there. Now, where we actually come in is whenever you need that 24 by 7 monitoring. And that's with software. So if you need, you got your IDS back in, and you need that monitor. Oh, but that Windows server, you might need that monitor. And those Cisco routers, or even down to your network switches, that's where we come in. That's where we sell our services, basically. And we've been doing this for a long time. I mean, uh, Softwick was started in about year 2000, and we, this isn't new. We do a lot of, uh, most of our clients are in the financial sector, um, but we do like everything from law firms to small dock in the box kind of places. Um, and this is my contact information. Um, you guys are more than welcome. I should have fixed that link. But if you want to find out anything about what's going on at Sagan, the kind of development that we're doing, check out sagan.softwind.com. Because we normally update that, and we have a mailing list. Because I have right now developers from around the world that are adding in patches and whatnot. So basically, they send me a patch. I can review it real quick and say, that looks pretty good. I like that. And then I can submit it to our, our tree, and then later on, roll it out. So we're getting new things added in all the time. Same thing with rules. Um, and I'm also going to put up this uh, presentation uh, at this following website, www.softlink.com forward slash papers. We write a lot of like research papers and stuff like that. Um, and if you go Sagan hyphen uh, North Florida ISSA, I mean, should be uh, pretty straightforward. Yeah, we'll, we'll put this out on the website and link in the website. Even better. Um, and then I think with that, I kind of sped through it here. Any kind of questions? You mentioned you were talking about the uh, Windows. Oh, the Windows. Um, so what we do with like the Windows environment. Okay, we actually have a piece of software that uh, is called a uh, event log to syslog, and it's been it's it's still being updated. We actually didn't write it; it started out by uh, Purdue University, mm -hmm. and another group kind of took it over. And they make uh, executable formats that you can get from them. It's off of uh, Google Code, and you download it. And basically, what it does it takes anything that happens in the event log 
and then flips it over and switches, uh, sends it out via syslog, for instance. Um, and that's kind of like uh, how we monitor like our Windows workstations. We actually have a rule set set up that's you know for Windows software. And keep doing it. Uh, we actually have a rule set set up for Windows software. So when, um, if we're in an environment where, say, we have 200 Windows workstation servers and whatnot, then I can go in just like I would any good IDS, and I can say enable the Windows rule set, but disable the you know Pro FTP rule set because they don't use that here. You know, you can kind of go through and pick out what rules you want. Is that kind of? Yeah, but that's uh, the level code that actually. So it's an agent. agent. It's an it's agent that you actually load. And it takes, okay. you know, very little memory. And there's no licensing issues. It's also completely open source. So you can grab the source code and compile it if you want. Mm -hmm. Or you can trust their executable binaries. There's no licensing. You just load it up. And basically when the workstation starts up, it's a service that starts with it. Okay. Perfect. Is there, yeah. Do you have any, any backtracking on finding on the source ID? What's that? Do you have any backtracking? We basically, well, we're depending on the software. So, for instance, Apache, like the web server, says it's coming from, the tap is coming from this IP. We're trusting that Apache is giving us that IP correctly. And very little cases do you see where that's not really the case. So, in the message, we're actually pulling out that information. Like, so, let's say somebody's trying some sort of, I don't know, SQL injection or whatever, and your Apache logs are being sent to your centralized server. When Sagan gets it and he looks at it, he'll say, that looks bad, and really it's coming from this IP address. You see what I'm saying? It pulls it out of the message. So if Apache somehow gets it wrong, which is pretty unlikely, then Sagan's gonna get it wrong. But, I mean, we have to trust the, the source and the nature of the logs that we're gonna get. So they use any kind of distributed IPs? Oh no, you, then you would still get the distributed attacks, you just have a thousand of those IPs in your in your network, like if they had like a big botnet or something, and they had a thousand machines and they're all attacking, then Sagan would log all the thousand IP addresses of where the attacks coming from. So I mean, we can, yeah, we don't actually go through and try to verify, like for instance, try to verify like did this guy really attack them? We don't go back and like end map them or try to figure out if he's vulnerable. We don't do anything like that. No. Any other uh, questions? Cool. Oh, How about it is different from the emission on outside that kind of software? Um, well, the big thing is that um, this is open source. I mean, <laughs> your, your cost level is a little bit different, but uh, for instance, like our site and stuff like that. Um, and I mean, uh, this is, I mean, something that we're trying to, there's not been a lot of engines like this. You do have software like OSSEC and stuff like that, that awesome, <coughs> but I mean, they aren't built for correlation. They are built to tell you bad thing happened and then tell you that. But then again, now you're looking in your email and going, bad thing happened. Let me check my IDS over here. Oh, did that packet? Oh, we didn't see that packet. You're having to do this. And what we're trying to do is correlate. And that's where things like even open source front, like OSF, which is awesome, don't do that. And if you get into the commercial space of doing this, then it gets really expensive. And see, we don't do, like, we're not selling the software. I mean, we can produce it as open source. We kind of go after like the source fire model, if you're familiar with that. They created the Snort engine, and they give that away for free, but they have a lot of services around that engine. We're kind of doing the same idea. That makes sense. Any other? What are your thoughts on uh, access control or session control as a you know, how it fits in with all this in terms of mitigating bad behavior or activity that you're obviously trying to track and log and on? Right, right. Now, how do you mean? Do you mean like, um, uh, for instance, uh, like VNC rule sets that show like when a person logged in and when they logged out, kind of thing? I mean, I, I was thinking more broadly than anything specific, but yeah, I mean, I mean I'm just using that as like a broad like example. A specific uh, a credential issued specifically for a task, for instance, via a, like an Oracle system or CA. Oh, right, right, right. Actually, Oracle system. That's one thing that we need to get better rule sets for. But um, um, on the back end, I mean, like if you look at, I, I'm assuming you're kind of talking about like uh, things like um, finding out who logged into what at what particular time or what time they logged out. What they stuff. do while they're in there. What they do while they're, they're in there. there. Yeah, it depends. Even eliminating the need really is kind of for, for right. some of the 
No, I mean, like on, on a lot of systems, we'll actually set the priority really high, but I can tell you, like if the administrator wants to go back and say, what time did Joe Bob log in, I can kind of get that information, but we can only take the information that we can get. So if, uh, if Windows isn't dumping to an event log that, um, you know, somebody is doing something, say, nefarious or whatever, then we can't get it. You kind of understand what I mean? I might not be, I'll, I'll get to you afterwards, but I'm not quite 100% sure if I understand the question. Okay. Anything else? All right, well, thank you guys. Thank you. Good. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it should, it should be fine. Okay. Okay. All right, guys, if it was any surprise, Tim Porter is.